Welcome to Headline News 24/7. Please click like and subscribe. Senator Collins revealed the final straw that forced her vote for Kavanaugh. Democrats triggered. The Supreme Court nomination process is complete, but it was not without fraught contention. Thanks to the support of more moderate Republicans, the U.S. Senate was able to get the votes necessary to confirm Justice Kavanaugh to the bench. Senator Susan Collins of Maine, in particular, was one who received a lot of attention for her decision to support Justice Kavanaugh after there was speculation that she would not. Now it is revealed what was the last straw that led Senator Collins to cast the vote the way she did. Senator Collins indicated that it was after the allegations of Julie Swetnick that she decided to support Justice Kavanaugh. Swetnick had alleged that parties took place, where Justice Kavanaugh was present, where there were lines of students, particularly men, to rooms that had women in them. She further alleged that women were inside being gang-raped. These allegations were something that Senator Collins could not believe. Collins indicated she felt these claims were outlandish and merely parroting what others were already saying in the meeting. The fact that Stormy Daniels' attorney, Michael Avenatti had thrown himself into the controversy by becoming Swetnick's lawyer also did not lend her any credibility. Her full speech before the Senate prior to the cloture vote gave a lengthy description of why she believed that Justice Kavanaugh should be confirmed. NBC News reported the following on part of Senator Collins' speech. Mr. President, the five previous times that I have come to the floor to explain my vote on the nomination of a justice to the United States Supreme Court. I have begun my floor remarks explaining my decision with a recognition of the solemn nature and the importance of the occasion. But today we have come to the conclusion of a confirmation process that has become so dysfunctional it looks more like a caricature of a gutter-level political campaign than a solemn occasion. The president nominated Brett Kavanaugh on July 9. Within moments of that announcement, special interest groups raced to be the first to oppose him, including one organization that didn't even bother to fill in the judge's name on its pre-written press release, they simply wrote that they opposed Donald Trump's nomination of 20 to the Supreme Court of the United States. A number of senators joined the race to announce their opposition, but they were beaten to the punch by one of our colleagues who actually announced opposition before the nominee's identity was even known. Since that time, we have seen special interest groups whip their followers into a frenzy by spreading misrepresentations and outright falsehoods about Judge Kavanaugh's judicial record. Over-the-top rhetoric and distortions of his record and testimony at his first hearing produced short-lived headlines which, although debunked hours later, continue to live on and be spread through social media. Interest groups have also spent an unprecedented amount of dark money opposing this nomination. Our Supreme Court confirmation process has been in steady decline for more than 30 years. One can only hope that the Kavanaugh nomination is where the process has finally hit rock bottom. Against this backdrop, it is up to each individual senator to decide what the Constitution's advice and consent duty means. Informed by Alexander Hamilton's Federalist 76, I have interpreted this to mean that the president has broad discretion to consider a nominee's philosophy, whereas my duty as a senator is to focus on the nominee's qualifications as long as that nominee's philosophy is within the mainstream of judicial thought. I have always opposed litmus tests for judicial nominees with respect to their personal views or politics, but I fully expect them to be able to put aside any and all personal preferences in deciding the cases that come before them. I have never considered the president's identity or party when evaluating Supreme Court nominations. As a result, I voted in favor of Justices Roberts and Alito, who were nominated by President Bush, Justices Sotomayor, and Kagan, who were nominated by President Obama, and Justice Gorsuch who was nominated by President Trump. So I began my evaluation of Judge Kavanaugh's nomination by reviewing his 12-year record on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, including his more than 300 opinions and as many speeches and law review articles. Nineteen attorneys, including lawyers from the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service, briefed me many times each week and assisted me in evaluating the judge's extensive record. I met with Judge Kavanaugh for more than two hours in my office. I listened carefully to the testimony at the committee hearings. I spoke with people who knew him personally, such as Condoleezza Rice and many others. And, I talked with Judge Kavanaugh a second time by phone for another hour to ask him very specific additional questions. I have also met with thousands of my constituents, both advocates and many opponents, regarding Judge Kavanaugh. One concern that I frequently heard was that Judge Kavanaugh would be likely to eliminate the Affordable Care Act's ACA vital protections for people with pre-existing conditions. I disagree with this contention. In a dissent in 7 Sky v. Holder, Judge Kavanaugh rejected a challenge to the ACA on narrow procedural grounds, preserving the law in full. 
many experts have said his dissent informed Roberts' opinion upholding the ACA at the Supreme Court. Furthermore, Judge Kavanaugh's approach toward the doctrine of severability is narrow. When a part of a statute is challenged on constitutional grounds, he has argued for severing the invalid clause as surgically as possible while allowing the overall law to remain intact. This was his approach in his dissent in a case that involved a challenge to the structure of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, PPHV, CFPB. In his dissent, Judge Kavanaugh argued for severing any problematic portions while leaving the remainder intact. Given the current challenges to the ACA, proponents, including myself, of protections for people with pre-existing conditions should want a justice who would take just this kind of approach. Another assertion I have heard often is that Judge Kavanaugh cannot be trusted if a case involving alleged wrongdoing by the president were to come before the court. The basis for this argument seems to be twofold. First, Judge Kavanaugh has written that he believes that Congress should enact legislation to protect presidents from criminal prosecution or civil liability while in office. Mr. President, I believe opponents miss the mark on this issue. The fact that Judge Kavanaugh offered this legislative proposal suggests that he believes that the president does not have such protection currently. That was the news. We thought you might be interested in knowing about this. Please click like and subscribe. Thank you.